That's dope. What is up, everybody? It is Scott Melker's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, June 24th. This is prime time. I'm usually doing it in the middle of the day, but very excited to be here in the evening for me. I hope all of you are having a wonderful evening, day, or even morning in some of your cases. So I've always argued that newcomers and regulars alike in the crypto space need a reliable one-stop platform for trading, lending, lending, and custodying. Basically one place to go for everything. I always said that in 2017, we just lacked that infrastructure and it wasn't comfortable enough for newcomers. Now, newcomers are often overwhelmed by the number of platforms that specialize in specific individual services that don't cater to a variety of needs. Well, Matrixport fixes this. And Daniel Yan, today's guest, understands what crypto consumers want and need. He's the chief operating officer of Matrixport, the architect behind their groundbreaking crypto investment offerings. The products he manages have generated over $5 billion in monthly trading volume. Crazy. So it's safe to say that demand is still here and Daniel understands how to cater to it. Daniel, man, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the intro. It's uh, excellent. And I'm really excited to see everybody here. Uh, awesome. Yeah. And, and I want to remind everybody, this is absolutely an AMA. The whole point is for you to be able to ask Daniel questions. We want you guys to engage and get involved. That's that's the whole point. So I want to dive right into this. That, that number I just said is astounding. Five billion in volume is a really big number. Can you explain what this volume is coming from? Where is this volume coming from? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, to five billion a month basically is roughly 170 million a day. And if I break this down, it's really go down to, um, you know, all sort of the products that we offer. So that includes option trading volume, feature trading volume, spot trading volume on Bay.com. That include spot trading volume on Matrix Explorer, include uh, structured products volume, fixed flex deposit, fixed deposit, lending volume. So all of like 10 different products. But if we break down these numbers, you're going to find out from volume perspective, there's a lot coming from Bay.com because that is like, you know, it's like a savvy trading platform where all kinds of people just trade with each other. Um, but in terms of, um, yeah, uh, so I think I think that's the majority of, of, of it. But obviously, from the number of customers engaged, that's the major sport product. That is uh, like the very popular dual currency investment, fund management, flexible deposit, and or just simple, uh, you know, leverage trading, spot trading. Is that where you're seeing the most of the demand now? Is for yeah, those right products, now. the yield, wealth management, that side of it? Absolutely. I mean, um, so it, over the past one year, we have seen humongous amount of interest in yield product because customers start to realize that, you know, not only buying crypto, earning crypto, earning yield in crypto is very important. For instance, one of our product, the fund management product in the past nine months, it returned annualized return of 45%. The customer do the math, they're like, oh, two years, I'm going to double my crypto. So I'm going to do this, right? So this is uh, getting a lot of attraction. How do, you, uh, how do you manage those returns? I mean, that's a pretty astounding number. What's going on behind the scenes that allows you to offer that level of yield? Absolutely. Well, it's quite amazing, but we need to thank to the market. Um, you know, before this drop in May, yeah, the market has been in a very typical bull run for like seven months, I would say. Uh, seven to eight months. Um, on the way, uh, cryptocurrency has been going higher and the future curves has been going steeper and steeper. That's a function of how much, how many customers are getting into these long positions in a leveraged way um, and some other reasons. And that makes the basis very expensive in which spot future arbitrage strategy is extremely profitable. I'm sure you've heard about that. And, yeah, you the know, cash and carry trade was very popular, obviously. And it's exactly. free money, right? You buy it's, spot, you short, the, you short the future expectation and you make money without doing very much. <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, uh, we have... Uh, well, we work with different teams on that, and you know we list all the returns on the on the platform. So whoever done have done this the best will get the most amount of volume in. So you know we're trying to make it a marketplace where people see which is the best, right? So that competition got a lot of good, you know, uh, guys out of there. Um, and yeah, the I noticed that. Product. Yeah, it's so unique because usually you just go to a platform, you have sort of a fixed product, and it says you're going to make nine percent. Maybe each month they change it, but you guys are actually showing where it's coming from and how it's being done. But I'm curious. What happens now with the market futures and backwardation? Uh, there we go. That's a that's a too sharp a question. I have to answer that. 
Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, the short answer is return is lower for now. Yeah, uh, as you basically have said, it's flat or backward nation. It's very difficult to do the same trade. But you know, there are three ways to earn yield in crypto. One is spot future arbitrage. One is over collateralized loan product. The third is DeFi mining. Uh, all the three areas we have done, you know, very deeply. Uh, we work with the best the product, and we have basically make everything automatic, so that people can just see the returns directly. Right? We don't have to, you know, uh, you know, change numbers and show customer prices. So at this moment, I think, I think the fixed income product, which on the back of it is over collateralized loan, is still good. Uh, but you know, it's only eight to ten percent, but it's absolutely risk free. Right, DeFi mining sometimes you can get to ten to twelve percent as well. So I think my judge, uh, my judgmental call is, you know, for this month and next month probably it's going to stay like this. But two months later, we're going to see things coming back and the spot yeah. arbitrage return will go go higher. Yeah, I think that that's probably the case too. So I'm curious since we've obviously seen this correction over the past five, about, I guess about five weeks now, six weeks. Um, are you still seeing the level of demand uh, in general? Because we all sort of talk about it in theory, what might be happening, but you can actually see it uh, yeah. on, a, on the front lines from how much volume there is, how many new signups, things like that. Yeah, good point. Uh, I'll go from a few directions. In terms of new signups, it's been really healthy. I have to say that it definitely, on a daily number of signups, has dropped a little bit from the high in May, but we definitely start to see it stabilize as going higher again. Okay. Always, it's a combination of all kinds of factors, but let's put it in a macro way. It means you know customers still like to get interested in crypto. There are typical customers, both from a high net worth individual or from just regular retails. The way to think is, okay, people have been nugging about crypto for, for a long time, and now it's like only half the price. So maybe I should just chip in a little bit you know, that's kind of a lot of the thinking out there, right? That's the new customers. In terms of existing volumes, again, I can't deny that it's lower from the high, but again, it's been going higher from the low as well. So I, I, that's why I think it's getting healthier. There are people like, okay, at this time, probably I have a lower level to, to buy. At this time, with this volatility, dual currency investment is getting very interesting with the high return. And there are people who are like, okay, it looks like with everything now making money going into the fixed income product is like a very safe bet. So, you know, there is rotation and there is interest. So I'm curious, uh, how did you get into all of this, right? Because yeah. you were, I know that you were probably trading uh, other markets and were involved in those markets. Why crypto? What was exciting about it? And how did you end up in this position? Yeah, I'd love to share the story. So, so, so basically, I think the first time I heard about crypto, about block blockchain, that was 2015. And that was the time, you know, I see one of my friends who just eagerly posting articles every week there. And to be honest, I should have get in, but you know, I didn't have really time on it. You know, it's, it's like at that time I was trading FX option markets and my market is move, moving like one to 2% every day. Now it sounds like one to 2% is like an extremely small number, but back then it's keeping me really busy. So, you know, I didn't do anything. So in 2017, I started to, to, to heard that Bitcoin price is going nuts from 900 to 2000. So I was like, I, I got to understand this. So I Googled a lot and went through some classes in Coursera and I started to realize that it's a groundbreaking technology and it's valuable. So from mid 2017, I started to look for jobs in crypto like very actively. I was like, I want to get in full time. So I ended up you know, in Bitmain Technologies in 2018 and I had a mandate to start crypto trading business there. And that's you know where I tipped my toes into the cryptocurrency space in the first time. Oh, that's very cool. That's that's great. So, and then how did you end up? Because you're you are effectively the CEO CEO of two companies now, right? It's Matrix Report and Bit. Yeah. Right. How does that, that work for you? <laughs> yeah. That seems like a ton of work. Oh man, that's uh, that's an understatement. A ton of work. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, you know, we we um, I was one of the founding partner of Matrix Report back in 2019 February. Um, as you said, I'm a CEO of the company, and we were building Matrix Report from the ground. From zero and we have seen very good tractions in 2019 2020 and uh, we had the idea of bit.com back then that we want to build an institutional great exchange which has a strong focus on options so you know we, we build that up from scratch again so and and obviously found out there's no other people to run it um as, uh, because myself is the best person who has you know just like my brainchild 
Facebook.com. So, you know, I'm managing both. Um, but, you know, it's um, it's always a teamwork. And I'm really honest and, and proud that we have like more than 200 people across Facebook.com wow. and they are doing the work. You know, I'm just doing the talk here. Wow, that's incredible. So we have a great question here. Over a full year, what's a reasonable rate of yield to expect? Over the full year. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, I think uh, we're thinking about from here right now, right? You must in yeah, from sure, I think. here, right? So I think I think the medium interest rate, I would call the medium almost zero free interest rate in crypto is between 8% to 20% depends on market. So let me call that 12, okay? So let me call that 12. Um, and um, and if you invested with um, you know a combination product like fixed income, and DeFi and spot future arbitrage, the, the the latter can go pretty high. So I think expect 15 to 20 percent is a pretty reasonable way number to me. That's incredible, especially yeah. when you see normal markets literally zero percent yields. Like a bank account will give you 0.001 percent in a normal market. I'd, I've always sort of argued that you know we have the joke that. Bitcoin is sort of the gateway drug into crypto. Like people get into Bitcoin and then maybe they find Ethereum, then they go down the rabbit hole. For me, when I, I couldn't get some of my friends to buy Bitcoin, but when I told them about putting USDC on a platform and just earning 10% and doing nothing, they understood that. Yeah. Right. So I think yeah. really yield is the most exciting thing that's happening in, in crypto right now. Is that what you're seeing as well? I totally agree with you. Um, I still remember that, you know, more than a year ago, we decided that the focus should be on yield generation because we just realized that, you know, crypto markets has been doing this trading and 2017 the crazy trading kind of thing. But, you know, with more and more customer getting smarter, with more smart customer getting in, you know, they're just realizing that yield is the one that, you know, you don't get hurt. Right. Uh, that's also the whole reason that DeFi is working for now. Right. Um, so I agree with you. This is a great question. Do you still trade crypto? And if so, what is your strategy? Oh, that's a very good question. I do not trade crypto. I do own crypto. And my strategy is buy and hold, uh, which, you know, holdler. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, I think most people are hodlers. I've always said, even if you're a trader, you should be mostly a hodler, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you make so, a mistake. Yeah, um, someone, asked, I don't know if, if you can, but someone said, can Matrix Sports start in Nigeria? Oh, very good question. I need my team to come back to me on that. I don't know I figured, yet. I figured the specifics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I hope we can. so. Yeah. So, what are you what are you seeing at the moment uh, outside w within the yield? What do you think in the next six months or year are going to be the most exciting pr uh, products that you'll be able to offer? Because you guys offer so much, and I would like you to dig into more about each of the things that you you are offering. Absolutely. Um, I think I normally think of our yield generation product, I would say in four different ways, okay? Um, so I think uh, the safest is always the fixed income product. And that's in general between eight to 12%. I think that's gonna be relatively general, but you know that's on the lower spectrum of our range, but it's the simplest product. It has no risk. And that's the kind of product we think for every newcomer, the end of our dialogue for one hour or five minutes, they'll be like, okay, I got it. The simplest is this one. So this is the one I think is very important. And then we have the DeFi mining and spot feature arbitrage, where you kind of need the customer to understand a little bit. They're like, okay, you know, you're doing some legit work here, right? And but the returns goes higher and lower, right? When it's low, it could be very similar to fixed income, like eight, nine percent. When it's high, it can be 30, 40 percent. So people need to understand that. And there are certain kind of customers like it. And the lastly, that is the structural product, like the smart trend, like the dual currency product. You know, there is some risk in it, but the return can range between 20%, 40%, 50%. Again, customer need to understand about it. So I think to me, if you ask me, what's the landscape of this yield game in crypto is going, will be going. I think the way we look at it is there will be, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be more and more transparent, transparent. The customers understand what is going on on different product and they make their own decision based on their risk and understanding of the product, which is what I want because I never want to say, you know, we just have an 8% for customer, trust us, give the money. I don't like that. I want customers to say, okay, you know, I know 90% what you're doing in Matrix 4 and I just leave the 10% for you to execute it. That's the way we think about it. That's how we, how we gain trust from customers as well. 
That makes that makes perfect sense. So outside of the yield, what are you seeing that people are excited about on the platform? Absolutely. I think anything related to innovation is normally what customer likes. But let me be more specific. I think um, there are two. I think I will focus on one that is the option related product. For instance, the dual currency investment, we introduced it first in the world in 2019. It is a humongous amount of interest. And even now, a lot of customers just do it every day. Smart trend product where customer basically, they, other than earning their, the yield of 8%, we're going to spend half of that into some option portfolios and which can you know change into 20% if they get the direction right, right? So we're just basically helping customers to take from your, your pennies and use that to buy options and to help you to maximize five to 10 times when the market is right. So all these option related products that give you non-linear payout, that's number one, which just makes it exciting. Number two, it's related to the market performance, which is a lot of the customers who are in crypto, they're interested at. I think you think about, right? People don't like to pound 10 times leverage with Bitcoin because they're like, I can lose money. But I yeah. do like that. I do like that. You know, you tell me that the worst I'm going to get is like 3%, 5%. And if I'm right, I get 30%. You know, why? Why not? Right? I love this kind yeah. of product. A lot of customers like this. So this is something I think there's going to be a lot of innovation, a lot of traction. Actually, we're going to introduce new products on that front. And we think that's something that make it fun for the customer and they like it. Yeah, that, that that makes that makes total sense. So I'm curious actually to pivot a little bit just because you and I yeah. were talking about it before. I know you said you were on a live stream two days ago, right when the drop happened and it was like all anybody <laughs> wanted to talk about. Where do you think we are in the market cycle right now? Because yeah. I know that that's what everybody wants to talk about all the time. Is the drop below 30K? Yeah. Is it a bear market? Is it a bull market? Yeah. I mean, it's this question I can spend one hour, which is not what you're asking me to do. So I'll just try to be <laughs> Start on this, you, right? You can take some time. It's okay. We've got time. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think if we think about how we think about this, there are a few things I, I think about. Number one, that is, um, has the story for crypto to go higher changed massively, right? So people talk about different things. There are Fed. There is, um, you know, the Chinese ban. There is talking about the corporate um, getting close to the level they bought in. So these are normally the start of the reason people think, you know, we are we're gonna go a lot lower from here uh, because you know all these things does not look great. But um, to me, I have specific reason for each of these. I'm not gonna elaborate, but I want to be a little bit more macro and holistic. That is, from macroeconomic perspective, it's very difficult for Fed to really take money out of the system. They can only change the speed of it only minorly just because of a combination of macro reasons and political reasons. Uh, and also the fact that there are gonna be more, there is more institutional involvement and we are seeing that. There are massive institutional corporate involvement getting into crypto. They're allocating that as an asset itself rather than just punting it, which adds a lot of demand into this asset, which, which continue basically the, the bullish long-term trend or what I call a super cycle for cryptocurrency. So in general, I think to answer uh, answer Scott's question, I think you know, twenty five thousand to thirty thousand on Bitcoin looks like a very very good dip to buy uh, from a five years horizon. Uh, we're gonna see terminals in the market. Uh, it's, we can still see markets, you know, probably rebounding to forty thousand and then drop to thirty thousand. Uh, but you know, I just think that we are not gonna be seeing a lot lower from here. Uh, and uh, as I said, buy and hold, that's my strategy. So as a buy and holder, you know, I'll be happy to, you know, buy a lower level. That's very simple, right? I don't care about those moves because eventually it's going to go higher. That's, that's me personally. Right. And, but you were a trader before. And yeah. so you understand the mentality of course, and, um, yeah. you know, and you have a platform, most people find it very hard to have that long time horizon. They see their portfolio going down and they panic, even if they think Bitcoin will be 150 or $250,000 in a few years. Absolutely. Right? You're right. You're right. I mean, uh, first of all, just to clear, obviously I'm not giving advices. I'm talking about personal views. I think for people who don't, uh, who is worried about it, which is, I fully understand, you know, go for the USCT yield product, right? Try to make like, you know, five to 10% in a few months. And then, you know, you'll be like, okay, I made money, right? Then let me think again. So you can always swap in between, right? If you're just conservative, you're like, okay, I'm out, right? I made two, three times. I just want to be stable, not worry for the next year. Go for the yield product, right? There's nothing wrong with that. 
That makes perfect sense. I don't know if this is relevant to you, but what makes cast, cactus custody any better than competitors? Oh, great, great questions. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think we, I, I need to ex explain a little bit about a custody solution. What are the key part of it that's gonna make customer you know, comfortable? Custody solution is something basically, you're telling your customer that we have this sophisticated solutions where we, we're gonna help to keep your cryptos safe, right? It's not about a yield anymore, it's just about safety. So when it comes down to safety, um, there are a few things. Basically, how you basically secure, how, how do you store the secret keys? How do you, you know, what kind of things you do to your secret key? Do you split it into a few pieces? How do you store different pieces? How do you encrypt on those pieces? Thirdly, where do you store that, right? Do you store them all in the same city? Do you store them in the same continent? Do you store them in three different continents? So the answer to all of these questions, again, I cannot elaborate, like spend 15 minutes on it, but on all of these, we are going to the highest grade. We spend the most money to make these things, you know, as safe as possible so that it's almost impossible for those things to be compromised. And, you know, um, when we compare it to other solution providers in the, in, in the, in the market, including BitGo, including Coinbase Custody, we are confident from those specific systematic reasons, we are actually have gone to the farthest. That's why we're saving. I'm curious to follow up on that. Do you think that we're at, at a point where it's relatively safe for people to store their crypto? I'm not talking about custody necessarily, but to store their crypto on exchanges or on platforms. And I'm talking about the known platforms, the not... Not like uh, the situation in Africa where they run away with 3.5 billion uh, in customers' yeah. coins, which we just saw. But, you know, uh, on the major exchanges, do you think that we're at a place where people can confidently, as long as they have their own, you know, security in order, leave coins on exchanges? Gotcha. Um, I mean, first of all, obviously, this is a question that I, I can only speak from my experience and my viewpoint, right? Because I, I don't run those exchanges, but I right. think they're, they're quite safe. The reason for mm -hmm. that is typical, you know, capitalism and business. When the big exchange like Coinbase, Huobi, Binance, they're this big, they're valued at multiple billions of dollars. They are spending seriously big money to make sure these things worked because it's a simple decision, right? So with those investments, with the absolute focus on these things because they're veterans in the business, um, I think they must have a very sophisticated system to make sure they're safe. But, you know, that's my thinking, right? What I can say is only for Matrix 4 because I know the, all the details of those things. And again, from a different perspective, I think Matrix 4 is extremely safe because I, I know the details, right? I know this cannot be compromised. So yeah, that's to answer your question. Yeah, I mean, I remember in the, in the earlier days, there was like people were using SMS to FA uh, on exchanges and there was really no, Yubi keys weren't supported. Now it seems like you have to jump through a lot of hoops to even send crypto for most exchanges if you set up the high security and it actually seems much safer. Um, and I think that's so important for new people, right? Because I just, as much as you're, if you're passionate about Bitcoin and not your, not your keys, not your coins and you wanna be your own bank, but I don't think most people wanna be their own bank, do you? It's very good I, for us, but your average person wants to treat it like a bank account or a stock or a stock. Oh, portfolio. I, I mean, I have heard about so many stories. People are like, oh, my God, I really just forgot where I put it. Or, you know, you know, it, I put it on a paper and, you know, in two years, you know, there's mold on it. I, I'm missing some letters. Uh, so, yeah, man, it's um, to don't make it a headache for customers, you know, just let them use it and, and be, be, be safe. Right. Someone asked a question perfectly along those lines. Very simple, but important. Why is matrix port easy for new crypto users? Mm, absolutely. Um, I think I think it's, uh, first of all, it's the way we build our product. We try to make it, you know, for a new customer who just click the link, log in, and they're going to be able to, the way the UI UX work is going to make it very easy to understand what are the products there and how to buy it. So this is something subtle. Um, you know, only when you use it compared to others, you'll be able to feel it, right? I got a few friends who got introduced by me. He's like, actually, I always have hesitation because, you know, on crypto, I just found it so complicated. But then, you know, in five minutes, it's like, oh, okay. I just click three keys. I start to earn yield. So it's actually the way we build it. Number two, that is the direction of focus that we build it, right? So if you go to an exchange, 
uh, a very good exchange, you're going to find all kinds of products, like 10 different products out there. And, um, you know, some is DeFi, some is trading. You, know, you just don't know uh, what was going on there. But at Matrix Sport, you know, the focus you're going to know is, okay, yield earning, that is the focus. You go there, you're just going to see different yields. You toggle between them, you click one, that's it. Right, so we just make it very easy for you. We do offer all kinds of services like the law and trading, but we just want to focus on one thing for you to get in and you trust it. And then, you know, gradually you're going to start to understand more about it. That's the way we think about it. Can product. you talk more about the loan product? Uh, Cause we haven't even touched on that at all. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, so loan product, I would say probably it's not the most typical product for a retail customer, but let me explain about that. So over collateralized loan or say, you know, collateralized loan, that's what we do. Basically, you can collateralize your Bitcoin serum and borrow USDT, USDC on um, LTV, for instance, let's say 65, 70% LTV. So that is typical for people who have a long term view that, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're going to go a lot higher, right? I do not want to sell it, but sometimes I want to spend money, right? I do need to pay my electricity. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you could pay my bill. So I'm like, okay, let me borrow at 10% because I just have some difficulty for three months. Right. 10% analyzed, which means 2.5%, uh, you know, for three months. Right. It's not a lot compared to Bitcoin, which can go higher by 100%. So people do this. A lot of people do this, especially in the mining community, which we have customers across the globe. Right. They're typical. They produce Bitcoin and they don't want to sell it. So the, these are the customers who use this product. That makes sense. Is there ever the opportunity where someone can take a loan and earn more, uh, earn more yield on the USDC that they've taken as a loan and actually oh, just yes. make money, make money doing that, that? That's extremely smart. Yes, we have customers doing that. We do. Yeah. So, but, so they can know, take a 10% loan on Bitcoin, but earn 15, 20, 30% then lending back the USDC through one of the other. Yeah. Products. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, to the short answer. Yes. Uh, but you know, uh, just need to make sure you understand a risk because when you collateralize your Bitcoin, you right. borrow USDT, Bitcoin goes a lot lower. You have a risk of liquidation, right? Right. When this risk is properly handled, you're right. You're borrowing. You are. You're actually not borrowing BTC. You're collateralized BTC. You borrow USDT, let's say ten to twelve percent, and you invest it into thirty percent. I I definitely can can think of a few customers who did that and make a lot of money. That's really incredible. So someone just said, I just saw that Matrix Sport has 10 billion of clients' assets in 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. So uh, the 10 billion, we call it asset under custody, AUC. So that include customers' asset who put in the app, earning yield. That also include customers, a, a few, uh, you know, quite a, quite a lot of big customers, institutions. They're like, I have this bunch of coins. I do not want to do anything. I want to put in your cold storage, right? Those are in custody. So our eight, our 10 billion, roughly, you know, 8 billion are those custody customers who does not want to earn yield. 2 billion are the customers who, who want to actively earn yield and do stuff. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So there are some other great questions here. I'm just scrolling through. What is lacking in the crypto space for larger mainstream adoption? Mm, okay. Um, larger mainstream adoption i think we're talking about make it so easy you can buy it at hsbc etc right that's, that's I, I think yeah to me larger mainstream adoption would mean that you know 50 percent of the population understands it and has some easy way and has no concerns about buying it or, or accessing it yeah sure. sure sure okay um i think i think that's a very good question i mean from product perspective i wouldn't say that crypto lacks the kind of product for customer to use it I mean, it can get better, but we have all the basic building blocks. So I think the issue is not with the product. The issue is really with the, the you know, the narrative, which come from the mainstream uh, medias, right? Normally, people, the mainstream media like to look at things like crypto is very volatile. There's crime, there's etc. That is not great. That obviously is making people uncomfortable. Um, and second thing is obviously. I would say regulation perspective, U.S. is going very progressive. Singapore is doing a very great job. Hong Kong is getting their licenses set up as well. So it's going very progressive, but we are not at a stage where basically you can have all the regulators saying crypto is 100% legit, do all you want with it, right? We're not that stage. So without endorsement from the regulator, from the government, and without endorsement from the, me the mainstream media, Right. It's like you go to mainstream media, 
people talk about, let's say S and P 500, you wouldn't find a lot of negative stuff. People would be like going higher and low, people allocating 401k, but in Bitcoin it's all about, you know, the best stuff because, you know, people like to read best stuff. So, you know, that's not helping, I would say. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, this is a, to follow that up, what will the regulation look like? And I was going to ask him basically the same question because if people need regulatory clarity, that means we have to trust that the regulators will give positive clarity because we know that yeah. in some countries that regulators may be negative and make it more difficult, right? I see. Uh, first of all, we are a company. Uh, we embrace um, compliance regulation because we believe sure. eventually be a great company. You need to be able to persuade them. You're a, the good guy, right? So, so we spend a lot of efforts on regulation. So it's, I think it's a good question to answer. What will regulation look like? I think the regulation will look in a way, so first of all, what does regulation look like in stock markets? Let's talk about that a little bit, right? All regulators, what they care is very simple. They wanna make sure that they put in place certain things that they kind of tried, they tried to stop average people to lose money on investment. I mean, they can only try. No, no one can stop it from happening, right? So that's the way SEC think about it. Um, and on crypto, I think the U.S. is taking a similar approach. They're like, okay, first of all, what kind of bad things is doing is happening in crypto? Money laundry, right? Terrorist financing. We want to make sure those doesn't happen. Okay. Number two, we want to make sure you know we that we have a regulation framework that you know a customer when they buy certain thing related to crypto, we know the company who is offering that. And if something bad happens, right, we can go to the company saying. Did you do bad things? Let me take a look, right? If you didn't do bad things, fine, right? If you do bad things, you know, I'm gonna penalize you. So they just wanna make sure the providers, right? They have been um, in lifetime giving them data, giving them information that, you know, what you're doing and you're not doing bad things, right? So think about this. So that's simple, you know, the regulation is gonna happen like this. As long as the companies will embrace the, the regulation, you know, get into a situation that the regulators like, okay, you're a legit company, you're paying taxes and, and you know, uh, you're doing things the right way and we're monitoring it, and then I think it's fine. And, you know, that's when, when things start to get better. It must be difficult to build sometimes, though, guessing what the regulation will be and making sure Absolutely. that you're that you're covering your bases for what might happen. Right. How yeah. isn't that a huge, a huge obstacle for you running a company like it this? It is, of course. So I think we're always a combination of trying to first of all knowing what is the right thing what is the bad thing right you know help customer make money is a good thing taking money away from customers is a bad thing so we understand what is a good thing what is a bad thing from a business perspective number two we try to actively be able to interact with regulators most of the time very inactively right from from the consoles from legal houses from applying for licenses from those communications understand are we right that this is what we do and this is what you think is right right so I think it's always a combination of these two. And the third, the third, obviously, is building a great product for customers. And at the same time, making sure that it's not breaking stuff. So we just keep thinking all the three all the time, every month. Yeah, so it's, I mean, speaking of regulation, obviously, the big news, FUD, whatever, has been China. Um, and we've seen a China ban and unban and ban and unban 100 times in, in the last few years. But the mining crackdown seems very real. I mean, the miners are actually leaving China. So what do you make of the situation in China and that being an example of a more extreme regulatory envi environment? Sure. First of all, major sports is a Singapore company. We have our customers in, um, in, in uh, you know, places other than China. So we don't really have operation there, which is great. We're not really affected. Um, we, I don't understand exactly the reason, so I think we're going to talk about effect rather, right? On, on what is happening with the mining community, that's what we can do. So, I think I, I have to say the mining community in Asia in general, they're not feeling happy. That's from you know my friends telling me, obviously because they have machines and they cannot do anything. Um, but I think the progressive thing here is, um, you know, they have always been talking about moving to U.S., Kazakhstan other places, and they have not been pulling the trigger. Why? Because they're making money. They're like, you know, why do I do changes? Now yeah, they're it's like- expensive oh, and It's expensive yeah. and difficult too. I mean, that's, I mean, people don't realize how huge these mining farms are. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And, they, and now they'll be like, you know, the bigger ones be like, okay, I know what, how to do it, right? I'm just gonna do it right now. The smaller ones is like, you know what? Let me host my machine with the bigger ones and they're gonna help do stuff, 
right? So, you know, eventually it's, it's going to work out, I think. Um, and the U.S. has been progressive outmining Texas. Um, I, I think, yeah, Texas is very progressive, right? Um, so I think that's, that's, um, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I mean, I think that it's a net positive down the road because, you know, uh, decentralizing mining from China and, you know, maybe moving to countries that are more concerned about renewables and clean energy and there's more pressure. So I think, you know, as much as it's hard to see it happening and the hash rate dropping, we know that it's going to come right back. Yes. Yeah. So right. what are the main risks for you, your and most companies with those regulations? What type of crypto will it crush like those meme coins, for example? Cool. Uh, what are the main risks for the company and most companies? I guess with regulation, what would be the main risk for you if there was some sort of regulation you didn't expect or something like that? And do you think that they'll come after coins like Shiba Inu and meme coins oh. first and, you know, not touch the Bitcoins and the Ethereums that obviously are established? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I think I think the most difficulty that is failing to understand what this regulator wants, and also the biggest difficulty is regulator come to you saying you are doing bad things, right? So I just really about the understanding. So there's a lot of communication out there. You just need to be spending resources on it, getting licenses, so that it's an attitude to the regulator that you are trying to get compliant with me. You are trying to talk to me. That is very important. People actually a lot of people don't get that. They're like. Oh, some companies know the regulator well, some don't know them well. So the ones don't know them well, they're gonna get, you know, screwed. Not really, you know, it's really about the attitude, the, 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 thing, the, the kind of thing you do to, to help on that courses. And in terms of the second question, to be honest, I do not know. I mean, I think Bitcoin, Ethereum, they have a long history. Um, and actually a lot of the countries has basically saying they're, they're commodities, but map coins, I really don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And it's hard to speculate in that, uh, in that direction, for sure. What do you see as potential systemic risks in crypto? Regulators are concerned about unknown systemic risks, too, such as Archegos implosion that impacted markets and bank losses. What a story that was. <laughs> Interesting. That is a story. Actually, one of my friends, it's, 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 it's dipping Bob in that. So it's like hell. Um, wow. But anyway, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. It's private. <laughs> so... So we're talking about systematic risk. Systemic here. risk. Yeah. What yeah. is there something that, you know, would cause a domino effect, I guess, negatively in the market? Cool. I always think in a financial system, leverage is is a pro it's 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 the opportunity and it's a problem. So to me, in crypto, leverage is, is also the issue. Um in um in the twelfth of March twenty nineteen, if people recall what's going on there, you know, the way it moves. Um, there are actually a big reason is liquidation. And that liquidation comes from leverage position on futures that come from collateralized loans, which as I just explained, right, the Bitcoin collateral, all of a sudden you have to sell all of them, both on centralized exchange and also on DeFi exchange. If people remember MakerDAO at that time, how the liquidation was going on, how it's almost got insolvent, right? It's basically in a very short period of time when other liquidation happens, you don't have enough money to cover that. So that is the issue that I will be really worried about as a systematic risk in the system. Um, but the good thing is in on the 19th of May, 2021, the most recent drop, you know, it's not as big as, as the last one, but it's very healthy. From all the three perspectives, from all the metrics I'm seeing, they're getting a lot healthier. It's getting healthier because they are, the systems to handle this are better because, um, with the pie getting bigger, they are not like full of all leverage players. So it basically getting more and more mature. So I think that's a great thing. So the systematic risk is still there, but it's much smaller. Yeah, you talk about March 12th, 2020. Um, yeah. yep. The day that, you know, Bitcoin went below 4,000 from almost 9,000. And it's, you're exactly right. I mean, BitMEX had that uh, convenient maintenance maintenance mode, right? But they yeah. basically turned it off when there was $15 million left on the bid between 3,800 and zero. And if they had allowed their liquidation engine to keep firing, they would have literally taken Bitcoin to zero on BitMEX that day. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. Actually, you know, this is one point I want to talk about a little bit. I haven't talked about it anywhere, I think. Um, you know, why are people so worried about BitMEX? BitMEX is a derivative exchange, right? That's because of one very important thing. Price discovery lately in crypto actually is leaning on the derivative exchange, Binance, yep. BitMEX. 
that is a bad thing, I have to say. That is a systematic risk specifically because you want the price discovery to happen on a spot exchange, right? When you want to discover price, you want that is an unlevered demand supply system where you get the equilibrium, you get closer to equilibrium, right? When you get it from a leverage system, that's really dangerous. You think about that, Big Max go to 1,000 and that price discovery got people to dump on the spot exchange and which got Bitcoin really going to 1,000. That is just stupid, right? Right. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So you have to wonder what would have happened on the bit stamps and the coin bases if BitMEX had stayed online that day. Yep. But like you said, we've seen a couple drops um, lately, m most recently May 19th, which was brutal. And I mean, hundreds of thousands of indi individual traders were liquidated and about 10 billion or eight or 10 billion, but it was completely seamless. Right, eight hundred thousand yep. people basically had their accounts go to zero, and there was no systemic risk. That's a yeah. huge difference from the year before. That's a good thing. Just a year, right? Just a year and two months. Yeah. Uh, next question: Where do you see this space going in the next five to ten years? Okay. So in crypto, we normally times five. So five years. <laughs> <laughs> I think so it's one year. <laughs> like, yeah. So five years is a really long time. So I'll try to focus on five years because ten years is really long. So let's say five years. I think in five years, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see a lot more customers in the crypto space. I'm not talking about trading customers punting. I'm just talking about customers who may just spend a few thousand US dollars doing a USDT yield farming uh, earning, uh, maybe owning a little bit of Bitcoin um, just to write it, just like you own some S&P uh, ETF. So that's on the customer side. We're going to see a lot of corporate institution having allocation into crypto. And we're going to see more countries, uh, smaller countries, probably taking Bitcoin, et cetera, as a, as a, as a legit tenor. And from the, from the copper side, from the company side, I think there will be more listed companies, crypto service companies in, the, um, in you know, um, stock exchanges. Um, and yeah, in general, I just think it's going to be a more and more mainstream. Again, there'll be more regulation. There'll be more companies who have license from company. There'll be new licenses coming from Singapore, Hong Kong, U.S., Europe, um, yeah, it's going to make much more people comfortable with it. Um, lastly, on product, I think there's going to be more innovative products out there. The option market will be much, much bigger. There will be exotic options. There will be options on uni, on makers. There will be, you can basically, you know, say not only that I can earn like, you know, 10% on my USDT, I can make maybe 5 to 10% on my uni. I can, I can do a lot of funky stuff on my, on my, you know, compound, uh, it's just going to be a lot more offerings out there. I'm curious if you're seeing, this is just totally me, but if you're seeing a lot of people utilizing any hedging strategies, uh, especially since we've been on the drop, since you obviously, you offer all kinds of options, futures products and, and some leverage. Have you seen people successfully attempting at least, you know, to, to hedge? Absolutely. Um, I've seen very, very good examples. Even in, I would say, uh, yeah, in, in uh, let's say in, in uh, May 19, 2021, right? Before that, uh, you know, we have seen customers buying put in size and protected themselves very well. And we have smaller customers who just, they have a custom of spending a little bit of their money earned from yield and buy put options to protect themselves. And also there are people who just use the smart trend product itself. They don't even go to bid.com. They use a smart trend product. So what is smart trend product? As I said, you can earn 8% on, on your USDT. You're, you're happy to actually spare half of it to buy some put options, right? To, so that you can make money when things drop. So there are customers who are buying the bearish smart trends, um, you know, periodically so that when the big drop happens, although they lost money on their Bitcoin, but they make a lot of money on this smart trend product, they're earning like 30% yield. So that is also a hedge as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Hedging with yield. It's in, it's incredible if you're just sitting there and at least you're earning, you know, uh, your 10, 20, 30 percent. If the market drops, that doesn't really matter nearly as much. This is a good question. Yeah. Why are you so passionate about crypto? Yeah. OK, it's good that you can see that I'm passionate. Um, so uh, <laughs> we can so, uh, definitely. Yeah, um, I, I really think is because, first of all, I do believe cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoin, Serum, they are basically creating a new world where, um, you know, it's internet money and um, 
uh, Bitcoin is internet money and Ethereum is a decentralized system where people can build stuff and uh, achieve benefit for everybody. So that is amazing saying, it's just innovation. It's, it's like one of the best innovation of 21st century. Um, other than that, with my experience in um, traditional finance, I know how products are built. I know what kind of products can make customer make money, what kind of product people should not touch because they may lose money. And I take the, the better products into crypto. And now I can see on matrix board, you know, we have 100,000 registered users and I would say really 99.9% .9 of my customer are making money. So that feeling is great because we are really helping our customers. Yeah, that's so interesting because that's so different than if you're just a leverage exchange and you 800,000 people are liquidated in one day, right? <laughs> Your people are coming, they're making money and they're staying. It makes it so much easier. And, and that also, I guess, goes back to the regulation. Regulators aren't gonna mess with you if you have happy customers who are making money. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I would imagine. But someone said to add to that question, we know Dan is busy. What gets him motivated to get out of bed each day? What's most exciting? Yeah, um, I think it's really, um, I think I rem remember I was talking to my to my friends in crypto space. He's also CEO of another company, you know, a very good company. Um, so he's like, you know, every day is a struggle, but every quarter is a success. So I think that is a very good description of our, our days. You know, being an entrepreneur, it's actually tough every day on the kind of thing you need to handle, um, the problem you need to deal with, and also the the strategic thinking you need to have. So that part is not that easy. But at the same time, you know that how rewarding it has been in history. And with that history, so every day you're like, okay, today I'm gonna see a few customers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably gonna be able to help them in the future. Next day, I'm probably gonna have a co interview with the regulator. I'll have a chance to explain to them why you know crypto is great stuff and why we're doing the great things, right? The next day, we're going to have our uh, strategic meeting uh, with the senior management, and we are going to be able to brainstorm on uh, what's the next. So all of those things are just exciting. Um, so, you know, that makes every day, um, you know, you can get out of bed and, and do your work. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. I'm curious. I had a uh... CZ, you know, on the, on the podcast at one point, and I sort of asked him how much of your time is spent just dealing with problems that come up that day. Because, you know, crypto is such a new space. I, I would imagine that you have unanticipated things happening all the time. So is a huge part of your day just dealing with unanticipated things on a day to day basis and never even getting or like having to stay up late to get to the things that were actually your plan for that day? Well, oh, shit. I can understand from CZ's perspective yeah. uh, because they're running a huge successful platform. For us, I think luckily on this front, probably I only spend 10% of time on, on handling problems. So most of the time can be still be spent, be spent on building stuff. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. You may not want to answer this one, but I'm going to put it up because somebody asked, Daniel, personal question if I'm asked, how does your portfolio look like and how do you have issues getting taxed? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a sensitive question. I'm going to pass yeah. on that. I wouldn't answer it personally. And I can just tell you that you're probably wherever, where you are is probably better than the taxes in the United States, which are horrible. Let's guess. Um, so uh, in the following, how does the, what is the future of financial system? What will the future financial system look like? And I love that question because there's the people who are the maximalists and say, Bitcoin eats the world and it becomes the global reserve asset. Then I think there's a more reasonable, maybe they're parallel rails. And then, you know, there's that whole sort of uh, hierarchy of opinions on what it could be. I'm curious, definitely what you think. Oh yeah, it's a fantastic question. A really good question. Um, I think, you know, every, you know, both crypto and, and traditional finance will stay on earth, will not go to the moon. Um, so they have to stay with each other. Um, so by this way, I'm saying, you know, it's not even parallel. I would say there will areas are parallel. There will be areas are merging. For instance, you know, um, there are a lot of companies working on stable coin payment now, right? So people can just do that uh, in their daily work. Um, those are, are the examples. So I think regulation, product, etc. cetera, the, the, the future financial system, you know, cryptocurrency will play a um, bigger role than where we are now. Um, and also from an asset perspective, there will be more people involved in it through very traditional ways, for instance, buying from your interactive broker accounts, right? That will happen. But um, I, I don't think um, that, you know, on one day, Bitcoin will become the global currency and no fiat currency will exist. That will not happen at all. I think, you know, they're going to stay with each other, um, which is the healthiest. 
uh, way. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. It's sort of the same conversation that people will say, like, something will kill Ethereum or will Ethereum be the only one? And I just figure there'll be a, a lot of blockchains and they'll be interoperable and they'll each do the thing that they're best at. But it is interesting. I do think that there's a future where the people who are left out of the banking system, if you're talking about future banking systems, the one who are still underbanked and underserved, they may have a full financial system with oh, yeah. crypto and never, ever go back or be able to access a bank anyways, right? That's a very good point because the unbanked people right now, they're not unbanked because they don't want to deal with banks because banks are somehow not able to service them, right? So yeah, that vacuum has to be filled. Yeah. I, so to me, like if we talk about parallel systems, to me, that's the most obvious is there's still tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people on the planet that have no banking and crypto can solve that right away. Right. Correct. And a platform like yours can solve that because you can basically do everything that a bank does better. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting. So you spoke about having transparency on yields to customers. How does your product differ from the other players who pool the funds risk? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so the way if you go to Matrix Sport app, you know, if you spend an hour on it, you'll be figuring out, oh, there are like a 10 different yield uh, products and every single product, they're going to tell you specifically where is the under asset, underlying asset, where is it invested it's structurally, where, or what kind of uh, things you're doing with it. And uh, customers need to know that what kind of risk and reward they have with that. So that's how we do it. So when, when you do that, that is like a full transparency. So customer know if I make this decision, I'm just uh, exposing this risk and benefiting from these returns. And you know what's great is not only to customers, it's great to us as well. Because when we are transparent with customers, that means we're not you know, kind of bearing everything on a balance sheet, right? If you think about the other model where you spare everything on a balance sheet, you'll be like, okay, you know, I manage $5 billion and I give you 8% and don't ask me any other question. So either I pay you back the principal and 8%, or one day this company just goes into problem, everybody is not gonna get their money back, right? So you don't like the, 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 the latter uh, result because they're like, what if someone else grew up and I, I lose my money, right? Um, so, so yeah, we, we definitely uh, like our transparency and I hope I explain, my, my, uh, explain the answers to your questions. No, I think you did very well. I mean, we've seen that already, right? Even with some of the bigger players, not that they lost it, but that their yield, yields went almost down to zero. We were talking about the cash and carry trade or the GBTC trade, right? Obviously, we know that some people, when that premium was gone, that was a huge problem for, for some <laughs> platforms. So, um, and I don't think that with most platforms, people have any idea how that yield is being generated at yeah. all. I can speak for the ones that I use. I don't, I, I've, I've, I went pretty deep down the rabbit hole of matrix port. It was really impressive because even for me, some of it was, you know, more advanced, um, but it was all right there. Like you said, yeah. like you can see exactly where everything's going, exactly how it's working. On these other platforms, you just park it and they say, do you want yield or not? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. right. And so uh, do you think that there is that sort of risk that any of these platforms could make one bad trade and it could, you know, to completely crater, crater the, the platform? I think the risk is definitely there. Um, but um, I think I would say it's uh, the devils are in the details, right? So think about that. Um, imagine that you're just not, not letting your customers know, but you are spending a great amount of efforts to, um, to diversify your investment portfolio, manage your risk, cut loss when you have to, you can still survive, right? But the problem is customers don't know. That is the problem. When people come into crypto, customers are like, I want crypto because it's open. And I don't want to end up with my open crypto into a place where it's closed again. So I think that's definitely a risk. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, any interest in NFTs? NFT. Yeah, I mean, first of all, personally, I really don't think I understand thoroughly about it. When I say I understand thoroughly about it, is it like I don't have the whole economical model where I understand where it's going, right? I think maybe I haven't spent enough of time. Maybe it's in really new stuff. So I, I think uh, to answer your question, any interest, absolutely, yes. I can imagine millions of things to do with NFT, but I just don't have a close loop on how those things can, you know, work yet. So I'm more than happy to see in 2021, see how those things evolve. Do you think that that's something that could ever be on your platform? Uh, that's interesting. I will never say no, but I don't know. 
<laughs> Certainly not the plans for now. Um, and listen, <laughs> this is a question I was going to ask anyway. What does the future look like for Matrix Sport? Can you tell us anything about what is coming? Sure. Um, so Matrix Sport, as I said, at this moment, you know, in the past two years, we have scaled to a healthy level where we have more than 200 employees. We got 10 billion asset under custody. We have, um, you know, we have two licenses in Singapore is ongoing, uh, applying one in Hong Kong. We also have one trust company license in Hong Kong, one in Switzerland. So we're kind of, you know, building our our communication with regulator in a very, po very positive way. So it's, it's in a good place right now. Uh, what does the future look like? I think um, it's number one, we obviously want to have much, much more customers. So that means you're going to see our name more and more from all kinds of uh, medias because we're going to be spending serious marketing dollar. We're spending efforts with with uh, with people to help us to 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 you know transmit message on what product we are having, um, and in terms of the company on its own, you know we're gonna be well, we're focused in Singapore, focused in Asia, but we are actually gonna be exploring more places. Hopefully, in the next one to two years, I cannot you know tell too much about that, uh, but you know our goal is simple: we want to be able to access more customers. Uh, we want to be able to provide more products on innovation. We want to be able to get comfortable with a lot of regulators. So they let us do the first two things. And that is all we want to do here. And so what's a, you know, I, you said one or two years to other places. What do you think the timeline is for all of that? Where you get to, where we get to the point where you can just expand at will, you know, go basically wherever you want and do whatever you want and offer these products to, to more people. I mean, still, I know you have a huge addressable market right now where you already are and you could yeah. stay there probably forever and still continue to grow at this rate just by people, even just in Asia. Right. So, but yeah. I mean, how do you get to, how do we get to a place where platforms like yourself can just operate, help people gain, bring more exposure to crypto? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, at this moment, we are really seriously respecting the regulations. So whenever we want to go to a new country, we just want to be able to access, talk to regulators and understand that, okay, you, can, you guys can do that, right? Uh, number two, that is, um, I think the good thing is we have a very good mix of products. Um, so that product actually works anywhere as long as you can transmit a message. So it's really about how you transmit a message. So we like to have, you know, local teams and to touch the ground and talk to customers, understand how to get the message to customers. And once we have that, I think we, we, we can just move really quickly. But I'm sorry that to answer your sense. question. Yeah. I, I, answer your question. I, I, I cannot give any concrete timeline so far. I can only say yeah. concretely in Asia, we're expanding very, very seriously. Um, and yeah. we're seeing good results. Others, uh, let me try to give feedbacks later. I mean, you have such a broad product offering. Are there other things that you think down the road you would need to add to be like sort of that fully encompassing experience that I touched on in the intro? You know, like I said, I think people want to go to one place and get it all. And you guys are very close. Are there other things you think that you would need to do where they really never needed to go anywhere else? Mm, good question. Oh, uh, very good question. Yes, there are. Uh, number one, we want to make the product even easier to use. So that actually we're building a matrix port light. Oh, that is a spoiler. I I, oh, I didn't want to yes. say it, but now I'm, I'm getting it out. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's a good thing. You know, we're excited. Matrix port light. That is a product which is gonna make it even easier for customer to use from the UI UX perspective. We're gonna limit it down to very simple, very simple product, just the yield earning and trading. So customer, let's say now they spend five minutes to understand matrix port app. They're gonna spend like two minutes to understand light, and we want to use that to access the first time users, right? For these people, they don't like to see 20 products. They just want to see, okay, oh, 8%, 10%, that's great. And we're gonna use it. So that is one very, very exciting thing. Um, and um, and uh, let me see, also, we are trying to have more collaboration on the fiat side so that we can accept more type of fiat in a more cost efficient and easier way so that customers can find it easier to get into the platform. That is extremely important. We're working very hard on that. Um, I think this too for twenty twenty. Yeah, I mean, that's about everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the idea of uh, simplifying it so that you basically have something for everyone. Yeah, yeah, you that's know, right. The, my, my my mom can uh, go sign up and understand exactly what she's doing with the light one, but probably wouldn't dig into your ten strategies for yields uh, too deeply, right? Oh, so, right? Yeah. What is future? Yeah. 
I know we're running out of time, but we still have questions. So I want to ask, what is the breakdown of your $5 billion in average monthly trades? Oh, sure. Uh, so the way I look at it is I look at it on a daily basis. That's average $170 million per day. On a $170 million per day, um, I would say roughly, um, roughly, I would say uh, 30 to 50% uh, come from Bit.com side. That's the spot future uh, options trading on the Savvy platform. And the rest, they really just... Uh, Kind of averaging out across our our lending product, our smart trend, our due currency, our spot trading, leverage trading, fund management, just everything. They just kind of even out in, in, in that area. How far are we, do you think, from having the full breadth of options products that exist in legacy markets in crypto? Yeah, that is, um, oh, that's a great question to ask myself sometimes at midnight. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so um, it's, it takes a lot of efforts because um, um, technically, option is a non-linear product. Um, so that means providing liquidity and uh, arbitrage and liquidity <clears throat> is actually many times harder than the um, linear product, right? Um, so because of that, building a new option market, for instance, I just mentioned, let's say, okay, let's say we have a uni option market. How do you make sure there is enough demand, enough liquidity interacting with each other so that it come to a scalable point where, you know, it just start to grow organically? That is a question that's going to take a lot of effort. So, I mean, we are doing, I think we are on track to solving problems like this. Uh, but um, obviously, I cannot elaborate too much because it's not out yet. Uh, but I think it's going to take some time. So probably I say in a year time, you're going to see more product. In two years' time, you're going to see the market becoming um, a lot easier to use compared to now. Right, because, I mean, those options are what really make the market more efficient, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, people see, I think, leverage trading in, the, in this market. They see it as sort of gambling up and down. I don't think they realize what the real intention or purpose of options is. But when you have that breadth of products, it really does help with price discovery and future expectation and really does stabilize the market, right? That's right. I mean, you're an options trader, so you probably understand it far better than me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I know we, we we're past our, our time here. I'd love to give you the opportunity still, though, to um, give your final thoughts, things that you want people to know, and then after that, tell them where they can follow you, uh, where they can check out the products, and 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 learn more. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I really appreciate the opportunity, Scott. It's That's great awesome. Thank you. It doesn't feel like one hour has passed. And I have, no, you know, <laughs> totally. and I've seen many very good questions, which, you know, which make me really happy because that means there are so many potential customers who understand what's going on there. Um, so, you know, it's great talking to you guys. Uh, and I think I have talked about what Matrix Sport is doing. Um, so I think you can follow me at Twitter. Um, um, I think, uh, but, but I, I don't, I, I don't have the handle right with me. Uh, I have it. it. Uh, yeah, I have it. I'll, I'll, I can share it below, but I think I have it right here. It's underscore D underscore Y underscore A underscore N. Yeah, for Dan Yen, right? Um, yeah. Or you can just search Daniel Yen Twitter. You can find me. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I would love uh, you guys to just take a look on our on our platform. Um, go to Um uh, or just search on Google. You're going to see the app download. And I think you're going to like it. Um, um, and, yeah, and we are you know, representing the company, I just want to say, you know, we, uh, we, we take customers interest the maximization really seriously. And we just want to build better products for customers. So we're going to continue to ship out very good cost, uh, products for you guys. And just stay tuned for that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I definitely look forward to seeing what you guys build. And hopefully, in a really long sustained bull market, and no more yeah. dropping. <laughs> yeah, that I cannot do much, but I hope. Yes. So if you if you could solve that, I'm pretty sure that everybody in the world would sign up immediately. <laughs> it's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> yeah. And guys, like Dad said, thank you so much for uh, engaging, asking awesome questions. I, I really enjoyed that. A really sophisticated uh, audience, and and really nice to to engage with all of you guys. So once again, guys, check out Matrix Port. Uh, everything is down in the description that you need under the video so you guys could check that out there and dan thank you so much for taking your time i know it's like early in the morning for you and later at night for me so thank you for getting up and doing this thank you scott thank you everybody have a great night bye everyone